pray at this moment. Would you bow your heads with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, as we continue in this beautiful moment and atmosphere of worship, uh, we just dedicate this time again to you, Father, and pray that our hearts would be blessed uh, because of what you have spoken to us and what we've heard from you today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Still doing the series on your Bible and you. Did you bring your Bible? Let me see it. Hold it up. Let me see it. Some digital Bibles out there maybe. I like seeing the physical Bibles. Trying to reemphasize that old Christian standard of bringing your Bible to church and, and making it an effective tool. I'm using the metaphors of Scripture as this series goes on. We've talked about the sword of the Spirit and, and the lessons that we can learn about our Bibles from that. Last week was the seed of faith. The Word of God is living and enduring. It grows and it's to be broadcast broadly. And now we're going to talk about the light of heaven, mostly about inspiration and revelation today. We'll see how well we can go. The Bible is called a light. We've, we're familiar with these verses. We sang these verses today, actually. Where'd Jackie go? Did I lose her? Okay, she stepped out, but we sang these verses. Your word is what? Your word is a lamp a light, a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Peter picks up on the same imagery in 2 Peter. So we have the prophetic word made more sure to which you would do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place. The word of God is called a light, a lamp. And we're going to talk about that just briefly. So for my kids quiz today, um, I think we may just have we do have two mics. I just have one general question, and I'd like the young people. Now, you notice I uh, didn't have a lot of kids here for children's stories, so not a lot of our youngers are here today. Jaden, can you use this one too? I think that'll be well. Um, so I just open this up to all the young people in the church. Why do we need light? And I know that sounds silly. That's okay. Be obvious. Be creative. Think about it. Why do we need light? All right, sir. Light, we couldn't see anything. Well, that's very deep. If we didn't have light, we couldn't see anything. Other reasons. Why do we need light? Delia? To help give you direction. To give you directions to see where you're going to go. Why do we need light? Would it be okay to not have light? What would life be like without light? Come on. Young people, okay, right here. Jaden's coming around to you, and I see Shabalovich over here. No, don't ask McKenzie. You can do it on your own. Um, I said we need light. Um, if we didn't have any light, we wouldn't be able to survive because, um, like most plants, um, need light. And if we don't have plants, I mean, if we don't have light, then we don't have plants, which means we don't have oxygen and food and anything. Wow, did you catch all that? I think we should just say amen and call it a day. <laughs> oh, that was good. Without light, we wouldn't have life. All right, David. So we can study for our homework. Oh, well, that's important. So we can study for our homework. Yes, that's important. Andrew, I see Andrew over here. This one, and, and maybe one more, unless everyone feels like we've covered it all. Andrew? To reveal the unknown. To reveal the unknown. Oh, that's deep. Mm. Reveal the unknown. Yes. Have we about covered it? Oh, Natalia, she was just showing how excited she was. She really, really wants to. And we're all going to be blessed by what she's about to say in the microphone in the next two seconds. <laughs> It ends darkness. It ends darkness. Woo. All right. Have we covered it? All right. Thank you, Toby, Jaden. I know it's kind of a silly question, but the Bible says that the Word is a light. So we need to understand why we need light. And obviously, we don't see. If we don't have light, we don't see. We understand that. 
We need light when it's dark is kind of the same thing. Did you know that being scared of the dark, I think it's still one of the top 10 fears that people have. Uh, being scared of the dark, doesn't matter what age you are, to be in the unknown, unfamiliar circumstances is an unsettling feeling for anyone. So the light is helpful. When we're scared, the light helps us to show us where to go. And then we did get a wonderful science lesson about the importance of life. Um, uh, light has the life. And it's relatively true. Without sunlight, there'd be no life on earth. Solar radiation is necessary either directly or indirectly for virtually all life. I understand they found some very deep sea creatures that seem to be okay with thermal radiation, but that's the exception. Unless you're a crab or worm at the bottom of the ocean, you got to have sunlight to some degree. Okay? It's necessary for life. So I want you just to think about your Bibles. Your Bible is a light. It helps you see. It puts out the dark. There's a lot of scary things in our world right now. Should Christians live in fear? We have the light. How do we know which direction to go? There's a light and a lamp to our path. And light gives life. Light gives life. So we're going to do a little journey today with understanding how God has brought us this light that we have. Okay, how did we get this light? We're going to do this fairly quickly, but I hope it'll be of value to us in this journey of studying and understanding our Bibles. I think every single Christian, if they were to be honest with themselves, there's been a moment in your life where you've said, I wish God would just talk to me directly. I know He's given me the light, but I've been in the light. I've been here, I've been here, and I'm still not sure what the, what the uh, answer is. I wish God would just say it. Take the job in Phoenix. Oh, all right. Move to the other apartment. Ah, now I got it. You know, you've been there. Why doesn't God, why did God, why doesn't God just talk to us? Well, the Bible says the reason for that is something called sin. It's not because God doesn't want to talk to us. But there has been a barrier placed between us and God. The brokenness and woundedness of sin has twisted us so that we fail to understand or appreciate the direct intervention of God. Let me give you a few examples. Okay, Right after sin enters the picture, Adam and Eve, God was there. And they heard God walking in the cool of the day. What did they do? Because of fear and and shame, they ran and hid themselves in self-righteousness. They ran from the presence of God because sin had twisted their understanding of God and they failed to appreciate the blessing of what it is to be in the presence of God. So right from the beginning, immediately when sin came into the human experience, a barrier was revealed between us and God. And God had to separate Adam and Eve from the tree of life. And do you remember when we talked about the sword of the Spirit? He put a sword between him, between Adam and Eve and the tree of life. He put a sword. If they wanted to see and interact with the person of God, they had to go through a sword. Remember we talked about this a couple weeks ago? There was a shining, flashing sword that kept them from the tree of life. It wasn't to be a barrier. It was to be a lesson to them. That, that now there was a, 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 a new device by which God would have to communicate with man. So right in the beginning, the Garden of Eden showed that the presence of God could no longer uh, interact with us because of sin. But there are other times when God tried to personally reveal Himself to His people. One of the major experiences is at Sinai. God brings the children of Israel to the holy mountain and He wants to do something powerful in their midst. He's already revealed Himself through the miracles in Egypt. He's already shown Himself to be a pillar of fire and a cloud uh, by day and a pillar of, flower, uh, of, of fire by night. But now when they get to Sinai, he wants to do something even more glorious. He wants to reveal his very presence to them. But what happens? He comes down in a thick cloud and there's an earthquake and a trumpet blast and thunder and lightning and the power of God and the sovereignty of God is so uh, awesome that the children of Israel go, wait a minute, we don't want this. We don't like this. Moses you and go and talk to God and whatever He tells you, tell us and we're, we're good with that. You remember this story? 
Okay, so Moses does that. Moses goes and he talks to God, and even in the diminished, limited way that God reveals himself to Moses, Moses comes down and he has such a halo of the glory of God hanging from him that even the diminished reflection of the person of God is too much for the children of Israel to, in, to embrace, and they tell, they tell Moses, put a veil on your face. We can't even handle the reflected, diminished glory of God on you, Moses, veil it up. Put a barrier between us and that glory. We can't handle it. So even at Sinai, when God wanted to, in a more direct way, talk to the children of Israel, it didn't work. On a few occasions, God will come in a more direct and revealed way to some of the prophets. And in almost every case that it happens, it's complicated and it doesn't end well. Daniel will faint twice in the book of Daniel as God is revealing himself to him. He faints. He falls into a deep sleep and it took the reviving touch of God to raise him up out of that sleep because he couldn't handle it. Eli, or, or, excuse me, Isaiah, when he has his vision of God in Isaiah 6, he says, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and the thresholds of the temple shook. Isaiah said, I'm dead. I must be dead. I'm going to die. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell among a people of unclean lips, and I have seen the Lord, and I'm about to die. And it took the special intervention of God, taking the coal of the fire and touching his lips, to say, you can handle it just a few more minutes because i got something I want to talk to you about. Ezekiel's my favorite, though. Uh, we don't read much of Ezekiel anymore uh, these days. The, 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 the language is quite unique to us. But in the first ten chapters, God reveals himself to Ezekiel in such a powerful way. Ezekiel hates it. As a matter of fact, in Ezekiel chapter 3, he says that the, the hand of the Lord was strong upon me and I was embittered in the rage of my soul. Ezekiel said, God, enough! I can't handle it. And you say, well, those are, those, those are when God was like scary. Those are when God was a chariot of fire and, and lightning and smoke and thunder. I, I understand that He can do that, but if only God would talk to me nicely. If only he would come to me as a gentleman. Well, he did that. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. They handed him over to pagans, and they mocked him as he was nailed to a cross. They rejected him when he came as a human. God knew the plan of redemption and the plan of salvation even before Adam and Eve fell, God knew He needed a different way to communicate to us because the directness of God's speech to us and His approach to us would be twisted through sin and He needed a different directory. We needed a lamp to guide us on the pathway. So this is how it works. God uses something called revelation. Revelation. He takes an individual, mostly prophets in the Old Testament or apostles in the New, but others at times as well. And not through fire and lightning, not through smoke and earthquakes, but through dreams, and visions, the impressions of the heart, the still small voice of the Holy Spirit, He reveals Himself to those that He has ordained to be able to receive the message. So that you say, well, that's all well and good, but they're all dead. Uh, there's no Paul that I can talk to. Peter's not here anymore. Moses has been gone a long time. The David who wrote the Psalms, I mean, he's gone. So God knew that the message that he revealed to prophets and apostles needed to be saved and enshrined. So he had them write down what they learned. We call this inspiration. Now, what they wrote is not this. What they wrote is not this. They wrote what we call the autographs or the original documents. They wrote on animal parchment and they wrote in Hebrew, in Aramaic, and in Greek. And it's through the miraculous... I want you to notice this green line or blue, whatever color you call it, 
it continues through. It's still God doing the work, but He's now doing it through human beings. And now this is a challenge. This is a problem. Because you can say, I can understand God, but you throw humanity in the mix, and we got problems. I'm not sure I can ultimately trust as my supreme authority anything that has the fingerprint of fallen humanity. This is a major, major debate within the church. What is inspiration? I'm going to try to keep it very simple here today because we have limited time. Jesus Christ is the Word, right? John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was equally the Son of Man as He was the Son of God. He was, he was completely man and He was completely God, yet without fault or sin. Amen? Are we clear on that? That is our conviction. That is our faith. So also is His Word completely the work of the Holy Spirit, but completely delivered through the language of man, yet without fault. But in the same way that Jesus walked this earth and had the innocent challenges of humanity so also are there innocent challenges to our understanding of Scripture. Did Jesus sigh? He did. Did He get angry and flip over tables? Now, are those sins? Did Jesus sin when He did that? No, the Bible says those were the righteous works of God being wrought through Him. Did He fall asleep in a boat? Did He get hungry? Did He get thirsty and ask a woman at a well for a drink of water? Are these things part of the eternal nature of God? These are the innocent challenges of humanity that do not speak to the morality, but do speak to the weakness of humanity. So there is language that reflects the weakness of humanity and yet without fault. Easy, simple, you got it. Now you know your Bibles and you trust it fully, amen? We're going to talk more about this. I, if I had time, we're going to get more into this. The whole question of inerrancy, verbal inspiration, the infallibility of Scripture, that's coming, friends. That's coming. You're going, to, you're going to see where we're going with that. But the Scriptures written down by man through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit are the Word of God, is our conviction and our belief. So we say, fine, Moses wrote it right. Paul wrote it right. But what they wrote is not here. That, a new process took over, which we just simply refer to as preservation. So other scribes came and they said, David, we love these psalms that you've written, but I think we need additional copies. We need to make sure these aren't lost. So a painstaking and sacred process took place where thousands upon thousands of additional copies of those original documents were made. Now, we've all played the telephone game, and we've all talked about this before. If you take a piece of paper and you copy it on the copy machine a thousand times, that thousandth copy is going to be faded, isn't it? Right? And so we say, well, Moses may have wrote it right, but those Jews living 2,000 years from Moses, they may not have had the right document. But notice the green line. God worked out a divine and miraculous process. You know, I mean, think about this for a second. This always makes me laugh when we get into Do you think God would kind of just give these sacred messages to the prophet and say, write it down and say, now it's all up to you, buddy? Whatever happens from there, it's just up to humanity to figure it out. I got, I'm washing my hands of it. Is that, is that how God works? No, God wanted you today in 2024, when you hold up your Bible, God wanted you to have the assurance that what you hold in your hands is the trustworthy, authoritative message of God. So of course, He continued to watch over and miraculously preserve those original documents in Hebrew and Greek and a few small pieces in Aramaic. Now, you've heard the stories before of how the scribes did this. I actually just learned this 
uh, recently, I didn't know this, when a scribe was making a copy, they did it, and there were schools that did this, they called them a scriptorium. When a scribe wanted to become uh, someone who copied the Bible, there was a master scribe who would overwatch it. They did not have a copy of the scroll in front of them, and then they would just, okay, uh, it says on the first day, God said, let there be light, uh, and there was light, and the light was good. They weren't looking at the copy in front of them. They were required to memorize it. In addition to being required to memorize that which they were going to write, they had to practice it multiple times before the head scribe would allow them to produce a final document. They had to have it memorized, and then they would have had to have written it perfectly up to a dozen times before they'd be allowed to write the official document. The letters were counted. They were, everything was, was meticulously maintained because they felt they were holding the Word of God. This wasn't a hobby. This wasn't a Sabbath afternoon game that they were playing. God worked out a miraculous thing in preserving the original language of the documents. You say, well, that's great. So the Greek and the Hebrew and all that was maintained, and it's, there, we have editions of that. I don't read Hebrew. I don't read Greek. So God did another miraculous thing. He guided in the translation of the Bible. Now, Again, people argue left and right whose translation is the best, which one is, is, is the most holy. But I believe that God has preserved His message, His light through this process, including our modern translations today. When God worked through Luther and Wycliffe and Tyndale and all of these reformers and all those who were taking the original documents and Erasmus and delivering them into the language of the common man, I think God was doing a miracle in doing that. Now, and He's provided all kinds of safeguards too to, def- to refine and keep the Scriptures accurate that we hold in our hands. Whether you hold it in an English translation or a Spanish translation. What else do we have here? Korean? Do you have a Korean translation, Stacy? Is it okay? All right. Okay, and I've worked on this hard. The Reina Valera 960. See, I still didn't get it. Nassim! <laughs> this is the guy telling you. And I understand it's the 1960, right? Because the other ones... No, friends, God wants you to have His message. Now, we've talked a little bit about pros and cons and being very... Um, Uh, diligent in understanding our translations, but God did not abandon this process here or here or here. God has been working through a miraculous process of ensuring when you hold this in your hand, this originated in the heart of heaven. This originated in the mind of God, and He has preserved it throughout the generations so that you have access to it. But it's not over. You see, we still don't have it. So we have it in our language, and using good skills, we have made sure that it is a translation that is, has been done through, through, through good review and processes. But I still don't understand it at times. What good is it to have it if you don't understand it? So there is another divine process that God has arranged for us. Oops, back one. Not the Illuminati. It's the illumination. I don't know why it skipped over like that, but it's called illumination. Only through the work of the Holy Spirit. Even though God has done this amazing thing of putting this light in your hands, It is still through the submissive and humble opening of your heart to the Holy Spirit that you can understand it. Jesus, after His resurrection, was walking with two of His disciples who did not know it was Him. And He was revealing the Scriptures to them and only through the work of the Holy Spirit, they said, was not our hearts burning in us 
as he talked with us on the way. They were with Jesus, but it still required the Holy Spirit illuminating their hearts for them to understand what this is saying. So after all of this, God has taken his message through the prophets, through the original manuscript, through the decades and centuries and millennia of manuscript copies, through modern day translation, and through the power of the illuminating light of the Holy Spirit, we now have the Word of God in our hearts and minds and we rejoice what God has done for us. But God isn't done yet. Why did He give it to us in the first place? Yes, He wants us to individually benefit from us. Yes, He wants us to individually understand His sacrifice and the redemption of our souls and the cost of our salvation. But He wants us to then apply the message that He's given us. Amen? If all of this was done just so that we can take it, bury it in our hearts, keep it to ourselves, and never share it with another soul in any way, shape, or form, I think there was a breakdown somewhere in, the, in, the, in what God was trying to do for you. The whole reason God has given us the Scriptures as a light of heaven is not just so that we can have the individual assurance of our salvation. Did you sing the little song, This Little Light of Mine? I'm going to let it shine, but only in church on Sabbath for an hour. Amen. Then I'm going to put it away Monday through Friday. Is that how the song goes? Shine all over the neighborhood. I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. I have no idea what a bushel is, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't hide it under a bushel. Bushels are bad. Don't hide the light. God has given us the light so that we will be a light to the world. Those who study the Word of God with hearts open to the enlightenment of the Holy Spirit will not remain in darkness as to the meaning of the Word. A heavenly light will shine into the soul temple and will be revealed to others as the bright shining of a lamp onto a dark path. The cost and the effort and work that God has invested into making sure that the Bible you have is His light is enormous. It's enormous. Don't neglect the gift that God has given us in making His light available to us today. This light has survived every attack of the devil, every attempt to snuff it out. It has been preserved, and it is for us. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, He illuminates, he illuminates our hearts to the understanding so that we can be a light to others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I realize that this is just dipping our toe into the ocean depth of the power and reality of Your Word. But Father, I pray that this has been a fruitful journey together today in appreciating the pathway through which You have persevered in trying to communicate with us. We wish sometimes that you could just speak and, and, and make it plain, but we see that the reality of that is sin would mess it up. So you have created this strategy and it is the power that is found in your word. Help us, Lord, to respect that. Help us to dedicate ourselves to understanding your word. Help us to appreciate the message that you desire to give to all of us, Father. And continue to illuminate us with the truth that we need in these last days. It is dark out there at times, Lord. Give us the light. 
Sometimes we can't see which way to go. Give us a lamp for our path. Help us not to be afraid. We thank you, Father, for the gift of your light. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.